Oh, Amen. Do you grab a seat? And, huh, you know, one of the most wonderful things about the God who created the galaxies is that he also came to meet us in Jesus and he's passionate about us knowing him as his father. He offers forgiveness and a fresh start uh, through Jesus and it's remembering that that we say sorry to him in the words of our confession. So again, join in with the words in bold as we pray. Heavenly Father, you love us so much you gave us Jesus. We're sorry for loving other things more than you. Lord Jesus, you love us so much you died on the cross to save us from our sins. We're sorry for living for ourselves and forgetting that we belong to you. Mighty God, you pour your love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We're sorry for trying to live for you in our own strength. Help us to depend on your Holy Spirit more and more. Amen. Well, we're going to carry on praying together. And uh, Debbie, I think, is going to come and lead that time. Let's pray. Let's start by pausing and stilling our hearts with some words from Psalm 36. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies, your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. So, Heavenly Father, we rejoice together and praise you for all that you are. Your care, compassion and love for us is more than we can imagine. Thank you that your arms are open for us, even when we do not deserve it. We're sorry for the many ways that we do not bring you honour and glory in our day-to-day lives. Give us wisdom as a church family as we encourage each other to grow in Jesus and keep our eyes fixed on you. We ask that you will continue to draw us as a congregation closer together and that you'll strengthen us in our faith and service towards you and each other. And Father, we also lift up our town Henley and ask that you will comfort and help the many families and individuals that are struggling financially, mentally and emotionally, and also those with ill health here in our community. Please bring to mind ways that we can bless others this week with our prayers, time and all resources. Amen. We ask that you will continue to draw us as a congregation closer. Oh, no. Thank you for our education system and the blessing of schools. Please help the teachers to know how valued they are and give them energy for the year ahead. We also pray for any children who have not settled yet this term. Give them friendships, motivation and peace. At work, at school and at home, please help us to offer our lives to you in love, in worship, in sacrifice and draw our hearts to know you more. Amen. Let's pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray as we acknowledge his holiness and lay our lives before him. The words are on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the The kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing again that first line, the the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall. This has been the story of human history. Um, It's no different today, and yet there is one God reigning over all. Um, And we're going to sing together and steady our hearts in him now. So let's stand and let's sing.
ask Debbie to jump back up again. Um, Debbie, tell us about this event coming up. Brilliant. Um, if you can't read that on the screen, it says the 27th of January, we're having a gala dinner to raise money for the Christians Against Poverty Henley Debt Centre. Um, all profits will go to the running of the debt centre so that we can continue to offer our services out in the community here. Um, what it doesn't say on there is that there's going to be amazing uh, auction items. I'm going to just read a few of them off. So paintings of local scenes, commission for a painting that you can ask him to paint of your choice, uh, Brecon Beacon's holiday home, champagne boat trip over the regatta course, wine tasting at home for six people, rowing experience, um, all sorts going on. Um, we're also going to have some like table, um, like sleight of hand magic going around the tables. Um, we're going to have a Milton Jones um, doing a show performance for us as well. So it's going to be a really fun evening. All the profits going to the debt centre. Debbie, thank you very much. We're going to pray for the debt centre in just a moment. Um, please buy tickets and uh, grab Debbie if you'd like to go. Who doesn't need a bit of a knees up at the end of January and all in a brilliant cause? Three course meal. There's much more, I think, that we could say. Chat to Debbie um, afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, coming up hot on the heels of that is our Vision Sunday. Um, this is um, going to be an important Sunday for us as a church family as we think together about the next few years ahead for us, some exciting plans coming together. So we'd love to make sure that you are all here for that. Um, and then... Oh no, could not load YouTube player. We'll watch that once the kids have gone out and once we've had time to fix it. That's something I want to let um, all the adults know as well. Um, listen, kids are going to go out in just a moment. At the end of the service, there are some things for you to pick up. Um, our prayer guide for 2024, if you've not got that yet. Um, our term card, if you haven't managed to get that on your fridge yet. And also, if you missed it last year, John Ryland, member of our church family here, has written a book of daily devotionals, a little Bible passage, and a few thoughts from it. And there's one for every day of the year. And they are free of charge if you'd like one as well. They're just on the table um, on the way out. Um, on the screen in just there is um, all the details for our kids groups. Um, if you're new and a young person, don't panic. You're going to have a great time. And Peter will be at the door and show you exactly where you need to go. So um, let's pray for our young people and then a couple of minutes whilst they uh, head off to their groups. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our young people. Um, Jesus, you said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And so we pray that they know your welcome and your love and learn more about Jesus together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, kids, if you head out, um, have a chat to the people around you for a moment or two, and then we'll come back together.
Okay, guys, let me just grab us back together. I think we've managed to reconnect to the internet. Um, so we can watch the, um, watch the little video. Um, it's it's self-explanatory. I'll, I'll say a few words after we've watched it. So um, here's, uh, here's the video. Oh, now the sound's not working. Hang on. Neither can cause two people they meet in found very attractive, very quickly, they fall in love, she's passionate they get married, and embark on a relationship that's designed to be one of increasing intimacy. I believe in this line about that's not automatic. We have to keep working to our marriage. The thing is, I wasn't getting much affirmation because I was interested in that from other places. That marriage was never. If you start building good habits in your relationship, you'll be reaping the effects of those choices in 5, 10, or 20 years' time. I can't let my past define my future. We have to build a whole reality. The aim of the marriage course is to strengthen the connection between you as a couple. Love grows. This is not a sickly sentimental idea. This is science fact. No, no, we don't really hear about. I don't think this would be fun. Marriage ought to be fun. If you're not having fun, what's the point? The marriage course is built on universal principles that are relevant to any couple anywhere. In years to come, you'll look back on having built a marriage as perhaps the most important achievement of all in your lives. Okay, fantastic. We got there in the end. So the marriage course is a terrific set of sessions. It's seven sessions, um, and we'd love to offer it to anyone for whom that would be a benefit. Of course, we're, we're a wide church family. Not all of us are married, but quite a few of us are. And so for anyone in that position, um, anyone who wants to keep investing in their marriage, this is not a marriage crisis course, as in like, we're in a crisis, we need to do something about it. This is an investment um, a chance to keep investing, even if your marriage is in generally good place. Um, so um, the, way, the way it works is that we've got the sessions available. We'd love to send them to you as a couple. You can then um, schedule time in your own kind of uh, term to fit them in together, to do them at home. But we want to link you up with an older couple at church just to meet up for dinner at some point, chat about how it's going. So um, there's a bit of connection point as well as working through um, those sessions as a couple. So having done it twice, I can highly recommend it. Um, and if you'd like to, um, uh, to do those sessions, come and chat to me. I'll make a note and we can send those to you and link you up with an older couple who can encourage you through that process as well. There'll be more information um, on our um, newsletter this coming week as well. But that's just a heads up on that. Terrific. We're now going to turn to God's Word together. Um, so uh, do pick up a Bible. And um, our reading is Isaiah chapter 6 and Mark chapter 4. Thank you, James. Yes, uh, um, first reading from Isaiah chapter 6. So that's uh, page 691 of your church Bibles. In the year that the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, 
for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people. Be ever hearing, but with that, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined, and lie and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken. And, through, and though a tent remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the, se- the terebinth and the oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Next reading is from Mark chapter 4, which can be found on page thousand and five in your church Bibles. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered round him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But then the sun came up, The plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelfth and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may perceive, so they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. James, thank you very much for reading for us. Um, Well, my uh, my welcome to Sam's. We haven't met. My name's Andrew. I'm one of the ministry team here. And let me leave us in prayer before we return to that reading in Isaiah. (laughs) 
Heavenly Father, as we come to your word together, we pray that you would indeed speak to us, that you would open our eyes and help us to behold your glory, for Jesus' sake. Amen. As many of you will know, um, Trinity at Four is undergirded by what we call our vision and our values. These are a set of biblical principles that guide our ministry. And if you're a visitor or a recent arrival to the church, then these are like the DNA of the church family. So we seek to exalt Jesus, we seek to engage Henley with the good news about him, and we seek to equip disciples of every age. That's our vision. And we seek to do those three things by adhering to three values of dependent prayer, biblical teaching, and being a loving family. This is a great summary of what we're about, and it helps to be reminded of it from time to time. It's there on the website if you want to delve into it in more detail. And the question for us today is, what is going to empower us and motivate us to live this vision out? What is going to keep us committed to those values? Now, I take it that's important because there are lots of things that might threaten to derail our ministry. For instance, as we seek to engage Henley with the good news about Jesus... We face an uphill battle against our culture, which is increasingly secular, where God is seen as less and less relevant with less to offer. As we seek to equip disciples in a whole variety of ways, we're doing so in a context that is increasingly time poor, making time for Sunday services, for life groups, to meet up with each other during the week, um, to encourage one another. These can be difficult things to do in the midst of everything else that makes demands on our time. And as we long to exalt Jesus, we're doing so against the desires of our own hearts that are easily distracted and turn inward, whether we tend towards pride or self-pity by temperament, our inclination is to focus on ourselves rather than Jesus. And those values of dependent prayer, of biblical teaching, of loving family, they're all very well, but they're not very glamorous, are they? They don't look or feel very impressive much of the time. And certainly you're unlikely to find them in many kind of corporate secular manuals for success in the business place or um, in the marketplace of ideas. So then, what will help us to stay the course? What will keep us committed to and living out our vision and values? Now, this is even more important as we look ahead in the coming months to what's next for our ministry. We've heard about the Vision Sunday that's coming up. What's going to happen in the next phase of our life in ministry together? Whatever shape that takes, what is going to drive us on? What's going to keep us committed to it? Well, today's passage, I think, gives an answer. And it's an answer that applies to us as a church family every bit as much as individual followers of Jesus. As we seek to live for Jesus, to honour him in every area of life. If you're here perhaps investigating Christian things, if these things are kind of new to you, then it's also an answer that speaks directly to you because this passage brings front and centre what really matters, where the Christian message bites for all of us. This passage does this because the prophet Isaiah, I guess, was one of the most driven people in the Bible, one of the most driven servants of God we could come across. If you look at the span of his ministry, the challenges he faced, you see a man who was utterly committed to his cause. And right here in chapter 6, we get the turning point for him. This is the point that Isaiah the man became Isaiah the prophet. What happened to turn Isaiah ben Amos, Isaiah the son of Amos, into this prophet of renown? Does his experience have anything to say to us? Now, of course, at first sight, this scene in Isaiah 6 might not be all that easy to relate to. It's a prophetic call, the moment when Isaiah is singled out by God for his lifetime of ministry. And like many moments in the Bible like this, it comes with a heavenly vision, a kind of peeling back of the curtain between our world and the heavenly realm, and you see into the divine throne room. And it goes like this. Do open it again. I think it was page 691 or thereabouts. Um, in the the church Bibles. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. 
Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Now this vision takes us takes Isaiah right into God's presence, into the true temple where God dwells, the one of which the temple in Jerusalem was just a kind of pale, shadowy reflection. This heavenly temple is clearly God's throne room where his royal attendants surround him, ready to do his will. But notice that it isn't his kingship or his power or his rule that is emphasised. What is emphasised? Well, the seraphim were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. What Isaiah is drawn to at the centre of this vision is the holiness of God. He is so holy that even the seraphim, these powerful beings that attend to him, whose voices shake the very doors of the heavenly temple, have to hide their faces from him. Did you notice that detail? That name, seraphim, shouldn't conjure up the, that kind of cuddly image of angels in white nighties with little tinsel halos, although, um, Julian, you did a great job in Follow the Star. I don't want to downplay that at all. Rather, seraphim in Hebrew, it means something like burning ones. These are fiery celestial beings blazingly bright with unimaginable power and yet they hide their faces from the one on the throne. What does that tell us? And they call out continuously day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, 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 familiar words. Many hymns draw on this verse. In fact, we'll finish our service today by singing um, a very famous one. It's a word that can trip off our tongues very easily, isn't it? God is holy. You know, it's a sort of jargony word. We don't really think about what it means. But to be holy at its root is about being set apart, being different, being distinct. And in relation to God, it speaks above all of his perfect moral perfection. He is utterly distinct from everything and everyone in creation in all sorts of ways. And yet the way that seems to matter the most here is his moral purity. This is a God who is holy. He cannot tolerate evil. He is completely and perfectly good and just. As another part of the Bible puts it, God dwells in unapproachable light. Even the way the seraphim say it here is important. Have you ever wondered why is it three times? You know, why are all those hymns that we sing, holy, 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 why is it not holy? Or holy, holy, why is it three times? Well, in Hebrew, you express the kind of quality or extent of something by repeating it. So in Hebrew, the word tov means good. So if you say something is tov, it's good. If it's tov, tov, it's kind of very good or kind of better than something else. But to my knowledge, this is the only place in the Hebrew Bible where you get a threefold repetition. God's not just holy. He's not just holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. He is the most holy that you could express or imagine. God is absolutely and uniquely holy. His moral perfection has no equal. Even his seraphim hide their faces from this glory. Now, what does the existence of such a God mean for the world? What does it mean for us? Well, notice first how Isaiah responds to this vision. Look at what he says. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah sees this perfectly holy God, and he sees what it means for him, because in this bright, blazing light of God's glory, Isaiah sees himself as he really is. Now here's a, a dated cultural reference. Um, this reminds me of the very first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Um, anyone want to have a guess at how old that is? Yeah, you know it is? 10 years? 20, 20 years. 20 years old. Um, that's how dated it is. But in that film, there are these cursed pirates who are under this kind of horrific curse 
But when moonlight shines on them, it's kind of revealed. So they look kind of normal. Then in the bright moonlight, they're shown to be these kind of horrific, rotting skeletons. That's what they really are. Most of the time they look alive, they look fine. But in that pure white moonlight, their true nature is revealed. And it's easy in the general run of things to see ourselves as, okay, not perfect, but, you know, we're not too bad. We all make mistakes. As Christians, we're all sinners in need of God's grace. We get that, sure. Particularly because when we think about our own failures, it's usually possible to point to somebody worse, isn't it? And say, well, you know, at least I'm not as bad as them. Maybe I was a bit generous with the truth there, but isn't everyone at times, it's just a little white lie. Or I know I keep snapping at my family, but people need to realize how much pressure I'm under. At least I'm not like one of those psychopaths who ends up on the news. We can always find a way to relativize, to minimize, to justify our actions. Either we do it by comparison or by rationalization. But we can't do it in the light of God's holiness. Isaiah feels the blazing light of God's purity pouring into every little dark corner of his life and suddenly all the grime and the murk becomes clear. He can't relativize it. There's no other response than to declare moral bankruptcy before God. I'm ruined. I'm ruined. I've seen the king. It's interesting that the description he gives, or that he kind of points towards in his own life, is that he is a man of unclean lips and dwells among a people of unclean lips. We often think little of our words, don't we? And yet, according to the Bible, they not only do disproportionate damage, but they also reveal our heart. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Often with great power to poison relationships and wound people who love us. We all know that to be true, don't we? Isaiah perhaps sees that his voice, which should have been joining with the call of the seraphim, praising the Holy One, was instead pumping out selfish uncleanness and that he is no better than the people around him. Israel, his nation, was meant to be a witness to the goodness and the glory of God. Israel was meant to be holy itself, set apart, different from everyone else. Holy, to, to point to that holy, holy, holy God. And yet, if you were here last week, we've seen from chapters 1 to 5 of Isaiah that Israel is in a deep crisis. They are under God's judgment because they have failed to honour him. They have failed to be his holy people. Isaiah's call here in chapter 6 takes that realisation and makes it deeply personal, doesn't it? He doesn't see a holy God and say, okay, I get it, that's why the nation is in trouble. He sees a holy God and says, woe to me, I am ruined. Because face to face with a holy God, there's nowhere to hide. He can't play the comparison game, he can't blame society or the government or social media. He knows the game is up. And this is important because, although we might not have Isaiah's experience, this is the reality we all have to face up to. By nature, the Bible tells us we are all in exactly the same position as Isaiah. Most of the time we can live in denial because, as I said, we can always find someone worse to point to. But standing next to a holy God, the only comparison that matters, and we're utterly ruined. Now, thankfully, that's not the end of the story, but it's worth remembering that it could be. It could be the end, and God would be no less just or morally right to simply draw a line there. But it doesn't end there. We read on. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, just a burning coal, that is, which he had taken from the tongs of the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, the key thing here is that the altar is where the sacrifices happened, right? It's one of the most important parts of the temple. It's where they took the animals, where they were slaughtered and offered to God. It's where the animal's life is, in effect, handed over in the place of the sinner to pay the debt, to experience the death sentence that the sinner deserves. By touching Isaiah's lips with the coal from the altar... Isaiah is being told that his sin has been paid for through sacrifice. 
he can be forgiven. Notice that this forgiveness is given freely. It seems that Isaiah is standing there in his helplessness and mercy is extended to him. All he brings is his need. He realizes his guilt before holy God and that same holy God provides forgiveness. And if you stop to think about it, that is the gospel right there, isn't it? As we all realize our moral bankruptcy before God, that's the moment that God himself in Jesus writes the check to cover our debt, if that doesn't torture the metaphor too far. If we were to look through a kind of wide angle lens at the whole Bible story, we would see that all the sacrifices and offerings of the Bible are just pictures in miniature of that true sacrifice that Jesus would one day offer. Except that rather than an animal on the altar, he offers himself as a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, as our communion prayer puts it. And that means that we, like Isaiah, can enjoy the same forgiveness, the same cleansing, the same freedom, the moment we trust Jesus. In fact, much later in Isaiah, we get a wonderful picture of Jesus as that suffering servant who would be crushed for our iniquities. Chapter 6 sets the scene for that by showing us the extent of the problem. Our God is unapproachably and perfectly holy. In comparison to him, him, it's, it's clear that we're completely ruined. We've got nowhere to turn. And yet, sacrifice is possible. Ultimately, Jesus pays the price for us. Now, perhaps as the passage was read earlier, you find yourself resonating with Isaiah's words in verse 5. Woe to me, I'm ruined. You might not quite put it that way, but maybe that's how you feel. Maybe you feel the weight of sin and failure pressing you down. Maybe when you play the comparison game, everyone else seems to be doing better than you. Maybe everyone else seems to have made all the right choices and completely avoided fumbling the ball like you have. Well, if that is you, then perhaps you need to hear the words of the seraph. See, Jesus has died for you. The price is paid, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. That's the gospel. If you've ever read The Pilgrim's Progress, um, that great 16th century, I think, um, allegory by John Bunyan, you might remember that for the first part of the book, the pilgrim carries on his back this enormous burden, weighing him down, an allegory for all the sin and guilt that he's aware of in his life. And he can't shake it off, no matter how much he tries. He tries turning to the law for help, and instead he just gets beaten down even more. It isn't until on his journey he comes face to face with a cross and suddenly the burden just drops off his back. Well, it might be that you need to come back to the cross tonight and shed that burden again. And perhaps the prayer time later in the service would be an opportunity uh, for you to ask somebody to pray um, for that for you. We all stand guilty before a holy God, just like Isaiah. It's a huge problem, but Jesus' sacrifice is more than up to the task. And now, let's think, if if one of our visions is to exalt Jesus as a church family, isn't that also a great reason to do that? If perhaps we find our praise for Jesus going a bit cold, then perhaps what we need is a fresh vision of a holy God to be reminded of the depths of our sin and of what Jesus has done to forgive us. And I take it if we want to engage Henley with the good news of Jesus, then this is what we somehow need to communicate. There really is a holy God. There is an objective moral standard out there that is perfect, that we all by nature fall spectacularly short of. We all deserve death, but wonderfully Jesus steps in to redeem Now, it might seem to you that communicating this to your friends or neighbours is a really tough sell. The idea that there's this holy God out there that we all fall so far short of. But in fact, the truth is, everyone believes this on some level. They just don't realise it. Okay, Everyone I know, and you can correct me afterwards if I'm wrong about this, everybody I know 
believes in an objective standard of right and wrong. If they don't say they believe it, they certainly act like it. They believe in justice. They subscribe to the idea that certain things are simply wrong and should never be done. There is an objective moral law that is universally true for all people and all times. Everyone believes that, don't they? And the fact is that cannot exist without the existence of a universal moral law giver. All right, there is no other basis for that than the living God. Unless there is a holy God, then there is no ultimate objective reason why murder is wrong, why the Nazis were wrong to do what they did. God's holiness, therefore, I take it as a good thing because it means that right and wrong actually matter at the end of the day, that there is a reckoning, that wrong will be put right and justice will be done. And as I said, actually, that's how everyone lives in practice, isn't it? The thing people find most difficult to hear is that they are on the wrong side of that moral equation. So it's not an easy task, and actually Isaiah knew that as well. So in the rest of our passage, it's as if Isaiah gets a commission himself to engage the people of Israel with this news. Notice what happens in verse 8. The moment that Isaiah is cleansed from his sin, he's free. And God calls out saying, whom shall I send to my people? Who will go? And Isaiah responds right away, here I am, send me. But look at the message that God entrusts to him. He isn't commanded to simply go and call the people to repent. God instead tells him, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving, make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull and close their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Do you catch that? It sounds as if Isaiah's preaching is actually going to prevent or hinder repentance. I mean, is God kind of working at cross purposes here? As, as Isaiah speaks God's word, it sounds like the people are to become increasingly hardened in their sin, blind to the reality of God and their need for repentance. Unlike Isaiah, they won't come face to face with the holy God. What's going on? Well, to understand this, we're going to have to keep coming back week by week as we go through Isaiah and see Isaiah working it through and God working these purposes out among his people. But the point is that he's allowing them to persist in their sin so that through the outworking of his judgment, he will ultimately bring about a greater rescue. And the key is that in the midst of this very gloomy task given to Isaiah, there's hope. It comes right at the end. So Isaiah himself asks, how long, Lord? Words that resonate often during a long sermon, perhaps, I don't know. How long will this message of judgment be preached? Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Well, the answer is, once judgment has been fully preached and the people have been handed over to the consequence of their rebellion, then the scene will finally be set for God's rescue plan to be unveiled. Look where the passage ends. As the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. You see, in Isaiah's day, in the 8th, 8th century BC, this judgment on the people is meant to be purifying. It's meant to leave a holy remnant in the land and show the people the extent of their sin. That language of stump is very significant. It's used time and time again in the Bible for the royal line, the house of David, the king, cut down like a tree in God's judgment, but leaving a stump that from which one day a new branch would grow. Here, as Isaiah is commanded to confirm God's judgment on the people, all the while this holy seed will wait like a stump of a great tree to grow again. Throughout Isaiah's prophecy, we see him wrestling with that promise as he looks ahead and wonders, when is this going to happen? And we'll see a little bit more about that next week. But of course, if we know the story of the Bible, we know where this is going and we've been talking about it already, we know that this holy seed will finally be revealed as Jesus. And when Jesus comes on the scene, eight centuries later, he quotes from this passage in Isaiah. We had it read as well from Mark's gospel. 
as if to say, now it is crunch time. This is when it is finally happening. The time has come to trust in the salvation that God is bringing. For those who hear him and the promise of salvation, then the cleansing and freedom that Isaiah experienced is open to everyone. But rejecting his word will only lead to a further hardening of heart, just as it did in the day of Isaiah. There's a lot going on in there, but what does that mean for us as we seek to engage Henley with the good news of Jesus? Well, Isaiah's experience is unique in all sorts of ways. We're not the same as him. We're not called to be the kind of prophet of the Lord, bringing the word to the people in the way that he is. And yet, on another level, Isaiah's experience is exactly the same as ours. It is the story of all believers. He meets a holy God. He realizes the depths of his sin. He receives this merciful forgiveness through sacrifice. And he is called to serve God in a hostile world, holding out the, reali- the, the, the kind of reality of God's judgment and the hope of forgiveness. If you're following Jesus today, that is your story as much as Isaiah's. We meet a holy God, above all, in the person and the life of Jesus. His goodness and purity. We realise, by contrast, our own sinfulness and need for forgiveness. And having experienced that restoration that only Jesus can give, then we are called to take his word on. And maybe when you hear that, you want to stand up like Isaiah and shout, Here I am, send me. Well, if that's you, then it's important to remember that our service for the gospel will have that same hardening and softening effect as Isaiah's. As we speak of our holy God, as we tell people of the forgiveness that he offers, that message will repel some and draw others. Perhaps you've experienced that in conversations you've had with people. Our call is to be faithful to that message like Isaiah. And unlike Isaiah we get to see the full picture because we stand on this side of the cross. What Isaiah caught a glimpse of, we see clearly. And how much more should that fuel our service? So as we close, think of Isaiah's responses throughout this passage. Woe to me, I'm ruined. Here I am, send me. How long, O Lord? Perhaps one of those particularly describes where you are. Maybe you struggle to shake yourself out of despair over your own sin. Maybe you are just raring to go. You know, here am I. Or maybe you're just on the journey and a bit weary and crying out, how much longer? Are we there yet? On one level, we'll find ourselves throughout the Christian life experiencing each of those responses time and time again. But the key is what is driving them and therefore what is driving us? Are those things, like Isaiah, coming from the realisation that there is a holy God who stands over us? Does our despair over our sin lead us to self-pity or does it lead us to the cross, to repentance and freedom and praise of Jesus? And as we go out in service of God, are we driven by that vision for God's holiness and the salvation he promises to us in Jesus? Well, let's pray as we close. Father, forgive us for how often we think little of your holiness and lose sight of just how perfect and morally pure you are. Forgive us for the many compromises in our own lives that show our contempt for that true reality. We pray that as we see ourselves next to your glory, you would turn us to the cross, that we would fall on your mercy, and you would gloriously provide the healing and restoration through Jesus, and lift us up so that, like Isaiah, we can say, here I am, send me. And Father, we pray that we would go out in that strength and desire to serve you with the gospel. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, friends, we're going we're to have 10 minutes or so 
of time for personal response to anything that we've heard um, together. Um, we're going to do that um, in a time of prayer. Um, so there's going to be a team up here. Um, it's a bit like communion. You c- come up, um, instead of receiving bread and wine, come and receive a prayer, either for yourself or maybe there's some other situation or some other person on your heart. Why not share that and uh, receive a prayer for that? Um, if you prefer to stay where you're sitting, that's also absolutely fine. Um, the welcome team will just kind of indicate when to come up if you'd like to um, as well. So uh, there'll be a bit of music playing and use it for a time of quiet, quiet reflection if you prefer to stay uh, where you're seated um, as well. Um, if I just ask the team to come up and then uh, we, can, we can get going. There's an amazing um, scene in the first Narnia book when the um, children are being are hearing about Aslan for the first time and uh, the beavers are there and they're asking about Aslan and Lucy says when she discovers that Aslan is in fact a lion she says well is he safe and uh, beaver says oh no he's a lion he's the king you know he's not safe but he's good well that's the God's of the Bible in a nutshell. He is not safe, holy, 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 but he is good. And that's what we're going to remember as we sing our final hymn together, holy, 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 this God who took flesh and died on a cross for us so that his holiness might be a place where we are safe in his presence. Wonderful, let's stand and let's sing this final wonderful hymn together.
Well, friends, that takes us to the end of our service. <coughs> I hope you'll be able to stay. There's tea, there's coffee, there's cake, there's food for the children. Uh, the doors at the back are locked. That's not because we don't want you to leave. It's because we want to keep our kids safe from the road. So the exit for everyone is through that door um, at the side there. You can either stick, for, stick around for a cup of, tea, cup of tea or head on and around to the, uh, to the centre doors um, if you need to leave straight away. Um, let's finish then with a final prayer. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen.